Um, thanks to the organizers for having me. This is my first CAA. I'm a philologist and I'm going to talk about another uh, world uh, heritage from <coughs> Syria, that is the archive of Ebla. Uh, writing in ancient societies is certainly a fascinating topic, for it touches upon what is commonly perceived as one of the core features of modern civilization. In this regard, the importance of study uh, ancient archives and libraries alike becomes evident, for these are the places where many aspects of the written culture came together, converging in a coherent, organized form. And you see here how, how I organize my talk, so I'm going to say a couple of words of, on why Ebla is important, and then on the nature of the evidence, the publication history, and the complex writing system of Ebla, and how this correlates to our digital approach. The site of Ebla, modern Tel Martich, uh, first flourished toward the middle of the third millennium BCE as part of a vast scale phenomenon that involved the spread of urbanization in the entire region. The archaeological excavations revealed a massive settlement covering 56 hectares. Around the 21st century, Ebla was the capital of a vast kingdom stretching up uh, to the Mediterranean Sea. Its large economy rivaled in size uh, with those of classical city-states, uh, just like uh, uh, classical Athens. Uh, on the Acropolis, um, the royal palace area, together with a series of temples dedicated to the major gods of the Ebla Pantheon, dominated the urban space. Yeah, oh, of course. Yeah. Uh, am I too fast? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, sure. Um, it is in the palace area that one of the major archives in the history of mankind was found, uh, together with smaller archives, which are, however, equally important. Within organized collections of texts in the ancient world, the Ebla evidence stands out as a privileged case study for a number of reasons. First, it is the oldest uh, archive in the history of mankind, for which good archaeological information on the primary setting of the documents is available. This is not to say that uh, these are the oldest texts uh, presently known, they are certainly older texts, but the primary setting uh, of those texts is not uh, well defined. Um, so the major Ebla archive was found intact within a collapsed room as, uh, sorry, as a result of the destruction of the city in the 24th century. Another reason why Ebla is important is that uh, the number of texts unearthed there is very large, uh, roughly 3,000 texts. Talking about complete uh, documents and not just fragments, uh, in total we have something like 12,000 uh, fragments. Third, the texts belong to various genres uh, which often overlap. So we have administrative texts, which are the most of the archive. Um, also, uh, administrative texts include the deliveries of silver and gold, uh, textiles, uh, list of workers, agricultural texts uh, related to land management, food production, animal husbandry, royal decrees, international treaties, in fact we have the oldest treaty in the history of mankind presently known, the oldest letters in the history of mankind, bilingual vocabularies, against, uh, again uh, history first, literary compositions, uh, ritual texts, historiographic texts, and so on. The historical significance of the Ebla archives can hardly be overrated. This astonishing amount of information provided by the text is, however, of difficult access due to the inherent difficulties offered, offered by language and writing system. Uh, the Ebla evidence is also extremely underrated uh, by the scholarly community, uh, as most of the relevant literature is unfortunately only available in Italian. The Ebla texts were published in uh, three venues, in the Aret series, the May series, and uh, in scattered articles. Um, because of the good progress in the decipherment of these texts, most uh, old editions of the text are, however, uh, obsolete. And these facts uh, obviously have a negative impact on the field of Ebla studies, and provided the initial impetus for the development of a database of the Ebla Royal Archives. We, start, we started this in 2007 as a collaborative <coughs> effort of uh, Lucio Milano, Francesco Di, uh, which is in Ca Foscari, uh, Francesco Di Filippo of Italian Consiglio Nazionale delle Ricerche, and me. In turn, the database built on the previous experience of Giorgio Buccellati of UCLA and Renzo Orsini of Ca Foscari. 
so now we, oft- we offer an updated uh, um, version of many texts that were previously published. Um, the new site, uh, we call it EBDA, EBDA Digital Archives 2.0, um, is just uh, out. It's uh, still in its beta version. It's available at this uh, site, www.ebda.cnr.it. So you can give it a shot. Uh, it presently includes most of the text published so far, that is possibly two thirds of the entire archive. So before I move on with a description of what we have done so far, I would like to spend a couple of words on the Ebla writing system. I thought we can just learn Eblite uh, together. <laughs> uh, this may also serve uh, to explain uh, our strategies in building the database. Uh, the Ebla documents are written in logosyllabic cuneiform, uh, which is not alphabetic in nature. Cuneiform is one of the earliest writing systems ever conceived, uh, and it is roughly contemporary to Egyptian hieroglyphic. Cuneiform was likely invented by the Sumerians toward the middle of the 4th millennium BC, possibly in southern Mesopotamia. Sumerian is an uh, isolated language as opposed to Eblite and also Akkadian, which are Semitic languages. Uh, Therefore, the writing technology is already an old one when Ebla scribes first embraced it, uh, almost a millennium after its invention. However, the Ebla texts are still rather uh, archaic uh, in uh, both shape and uh, content, content in that they usually provide very limited grammatical information. Text layout at Ebla is also archaic, especially with regards to administrative texts, which form most of the archive. Information is usually arranged in columns, each containing several boxes. Each box usually contains a semantic hole, such as a number plus a noun or a verbal form. Punctuation is absent, uh, although blank spaces of variable length um, are sometimes used to divide the text into logical units. You see an example here. Uh, Going back to the writing system, words are often written down as signs representing the bare root alone without further grammatical information. So for instance, the sign ka, which is originally is a pictographic uh, uh, sign representing a human head plus some extra uh, steeplings marking the mouth, may be used to express either mouth, tooth, nose, or verbs such as I speak, uh, you speak, uh, he or she speaks, uh, he spoke, and so forth. Uh, besides as a logogram, a sign may be used for its uh, syllabic uh, part alone. And also, you see here some syllabic signs, uh, syllabic values attached to a cuneiform sign. Also, as a determinatives, uh, determinatives are signs that are not pronounced but help the reader decide what value should be uh, attached to the nearby signs. So, as it appears from the discussion above, uh, um, usually a given sign is associated with multiple logographic and or syllabic values and or determinative values. In this way, the scribes could reduce the total number of graphemes to be memorized, uh, exploiting the so-called polyvalence principle. Individual words may be spelled differently depending on orthographic traditions, context, and possibly on the scribal mood for that day. For instance, the word for night may may be spelled logographically using a compound logogram made of two signs, namely me and an. The first sign that is me, See if I can use this. Sign me. Uh, usually, in originally, is a pictographic representation of a rainy cloud. That would be the rain. That would be the cloud. And then the sign A. Originally, it's a star conveying the meaning sky. Thus, the compound dark plus sky uh, conveys the meaning night, and it's read musum in a black. On the other hand, uh, Skype could, could also write down uh, stuff uh, uh, syllabically with two signs, uh, mu and shum. Um, cuneiform writing system uh, was invented almost a millennium earlier than the first Ebla text, as I mentioned before. Uh, a word written down according to its original Sumerian spelling, but read in the local language that is Eblite, is also labeled a Sumerogram. <coughs> In fact, all Sumerograms are logograms. Ebla scribes, however, didn't got their writing system directly from the Sumerians, they got it from the Akkadians, which are another Semitic population 
probably originally stemming from somewhere in the Tigris area. Together with the writing system developed by the Sumerians, Ebla scribes took the habit of writing down a few words according to their frozen Akkadian spelling, and such words are labeled Akkadograms. In addition, we also have um, a frozen Ebla spelling that we call Eblaitograms, and we want to capture all this complexity of the writing system with our database. Uh, as for uh, graphemics uh, uh, analysis and allography, just let me say a couple of words. Uh, uh, they could uh, use signs uh, and combine them to get um, variant uh, uh, signs, depending on the scribal tradition. So you have two signs, the sign for mouth and the sign for bread. And it's read, the, the whole thing is read to, uh, means to eat. They could also place the uh, bread sign inside uh, the, the other one. And then we have uh, um, this sign, which is uh, uh, composed of two, two signs, in fact, and they could arrange these two either ways. Uh, this means additional, and we wanted also to capture this level of complexity in our database. Um, as writing is a human product, it is subject to variation, <coughs> complications, and errors. Unexpected spellings occur quite often within the Abla corpus. In transliterations, these are marked by an exclamation mark. For instance, the word for weaver is invariably written to gnutag, as you see here. But in some cases, the scribe has taken this sign for this one, and we translate it to two, and then exclamation mark, and in parentheses, we have the actual sign which is on the tablet. Um, uh, finally, as a further element of perplexity, it must be mentioned that some words at Ebla are spelled backwards, such is the case of the word for silver, which is written uh, kubar in Sumerian, but in Ebla is written bar ku, um, meaning literally something like shiny metal. Uh, these facts uh, make clear that there is no linear correlation between signs and words. We are, however, interested in capturing all levels of information, from uninterpreted signs to the interpreted text structure, uh, to interpreted text, sorry, structure in sentences and textual sections. The complexity of cuneiform texts uh, translates in a dedicated model for the Ebla writing system, which captures uh, relations for signs, allographs, uh, logographs, uh, syllabic and determinative values, etc. Um, specialists in cuneiform studies are hence able to digitally explore the archive's content using simple and advanced queries. One may look for individual words, part of words within boundaries, such as, such as for instance, words that begin in a certain way or end in a certain way, or words that may be passed through regular expressions, even though nobody is using regular expressions presently because philologists they don't like uh, <laughs> learning uh, such a thing. Uh, it's a very powerful tool. Anyways, uh, words, one may search for words occurring together with other words uh, or sign sequences. One may also filter the results by edition volume and word class. That means uh, one may be interested only in uh, personal names or geographical names, etc. As for the workflow, the primary input consists of transliterated texts encoded according to a shallow markup <coughs> system. A complete overview of the rules and convention adopted uh, in our database is not possible here. It suffices to say that special codes mark interesting features to us, such as the uh, physical condition of the tablet, or again, if a, a certain term is a personal name or a verbal form. Also, we are interested in the um, system, um, in the actual uh, language uh, in which the individual words are spelled out, such as this is a sumerogram, this is an arcadogram, etc. The shallow annotated text file is then passed uh, to a Python parser, which performs a series of preprocessing -proc -pre operations, uh, and then it passes uh, uh, the output to, to the data repository, and in doing that, uh, um, also provides some uh, um, consistency uh, check. And you see a sample transliteration here, uh, which I color-coded, it's not totally clear. We have a heading here, 
And then uh, uh, personal names are marked with this P underscore, which is quite convenient way to encode stuff. Um, and then we have our re uh, reserve strings, uh, reserve strings to mark the condition of the topic. Um, a web interface then displays the database content to the users uh, and each text is complemented by photos when available. As a parallel development to the database, the archive content can be analyzed through network analysis software. And you see here a model of all uh, the texts in our database. It's a very um, a colorful uh, cloud and in it uh, almost every pixel represents a text. And uh, two texts are um, joined by an arc uh, in case they share personal names. So if a guy appears, uh, oops, if a guy appears, uh, let's say, in a text over here and a text over there, then uh, an arc is created. Um, so why one might have a um, view at a glance of the archive content. Of course, uh, I run a um, uh, clustering algorithm, and this is the very core of the Ebla network when you filter out uh, unclear connections. And in case you wonder what this all means, uh, um, so I check the uh, content of the tablet uh, against uh, the uh, their color-coded uh, an automatically generated clustering and so we can say that uh, um, the economy of Ebla moved uh, in, I mean temporarily moved from here to here and moved from uh, uh, textiles we have um, textiles um, that are accounted for at the beginning of the archive that roughly covers 40 years and here we have textiles that uh, um, are accounted for in the middle of the archive. At the very end, uh, administration uh, got more interested in silver, textiles and cattle. And here we have a small archive of alimentary items, so one might explore the archive content uh, this way. Uh, and also one can play with engrams. I don't have time enough to say much about engrams, but these uh, engrams are uh, um, pretty nice way for um, performing error checking and restorations and uh, um, check the predictability of these texts. Turns out that the Ebla texts are kind of predictable. If you have a sequence of three signs, then uh, based on the readings of the first two signs, you can predict the reading of the third sign with a probability of 92.9%. Um, going back to the relational, relational database scheme, uh, the current implementation of this system is based on PostgreSQL. Uh, the model can be conceptualized in blocks. Of interest here is the annotation block you see here. Um, so this is not my work, I'm not uh, uh, too much an IT guy. Um, but we conceived a system for uh, annotation of the text, uh, also of non-contiguous elements, and this overcomes the limit of XML um, implementations. So that's why we didn't opt for XML, also because writing is often non-linear, as I mentioned in advance. So a final, a couple of final remarks and future perspectives. Uh, the complexity of cuneiform writing system of EBLA offers uh, stimulating challenges to specialists in philology, information technology, and digital humanities alike. The development of innovative software is, however, a slow and expensive process as it requires close cooperation of experts in diverse fields. In order to minimize uh, these drawbacks, it is important for philologists to develop the hybrid expertise, which would greatly <coughs> facilitate the dialogue with information technology experts. This would also greatly benefit their potential, or our potential as scholars, as basic knowledge of uh, query languages, scripting techniques, and databases opens up research avenues that would otherwise remain silent. Not only because of inevitable limitation in funding, but also because of the overall lack of vision. During the past few years, we witnessed the emergence of a considerable amount of projects involved in digital editions of cuneiform corpora. Paradoxically, the tremendous amount of work implied there has been perceived as something considerably different from traditional printed editions. Part of the issue is related to the actual, sorry, the actual evaluation system for the research products. 
which in European countries, at least, is not yet capable of adequately, uh, adequately evaluate the tremendous impact of state-of-the-art online digital tools, which are, in fact, research products per se. Another part of the issue may be related to the fact that current online projects uh, show very high degree of variability. Most of them opted for proprietary conventions for the digital representations of their content, either adapting an existing markup language or setting up an original one, as we did for the EBITDA project. In fact, despite of our efforts, many things still need to be done. 3D reconstruction of the archival settings, natural language processing implementations based on both ancient texts and modern transliterations, online dictionaries, translations, all valuable tools that will fu further complement our effort in resurrecting the oldest archive in the history of mankind. So we also have the bibliographic index, uh, and thank you very much. You can send me an email. Uh, if you like.